Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. Let's pivot to the U.S. economy right now and get some perspective there. Wilbur Ross, the former U.S. Commerce Secretary under Donald Trump, told Bloomberg where he thinks the U.S. economy is heading. I think the U.S. is heading toward probably a very mild uh, recessionary period. And that shouldn't be too surprising. It was artificially propped up by all the great situations that had prevailed and all the cash that was pumped into the economy in the aftermath of COVID. Uh, I think they overdid that. That was Wilbur Ross, former U.S. Secretary of Commerce under Donald Trump's first administration there, talking about a very mild recessionary period. That's his expectation. Uh, let's get another perspective on the U.S. economy and on markets, on deals and much beyond. We're pleased to say we're joined by Ralph uh, Schostein, Evercore Chairman Emeritus and BlackRock co-founder. Ralph, really nice to, to see you this morning. Welcome to the studio. Thanks very much for joining us. Let's start with your sort of in-the-moment market expectations. There's a lot of people wondering whether we're we're going to get a cut of 25, 50 basis points from the Fed next week seems to matter. I wonder if in the grand scheme of things, that's the sort of thing that matters to you because of the signaling it might give to markets. What are you thinking? I do think it does matter. And if I were in the room, I would actually be uh, pushing for a 50 basis point rather than a 25 basis point cut. Not because I think the economy is... Uh, on the verge of recession, but I think the balance of risks has shifted from uh, a risk that inflation doesn't come down as we hope to a risk that unemployment and uh, grows up faster than we would hope and employment doesn't grow as fast as we would hope. Mm. And as a result, uh, I think the the argument for moving uh, toward neutral is a pretty strong one. Okay, so you're in the 50 camp. Yes. Is, would that be take, would a 50 I'm not saying they'll do that. Sure. I'm saying that's what if I think they the should room. do. Yes. yes. So if, if we, uh, is there a danger though that if they did 50 that that spooks the horses? Would this be taken as risk on or risk off do you think by Mark? I, I think the, uh, the, I believe the right thing to do is 50 for two reasons. One, I think the balance of risks are more in in the slower employment growth. And second, uh, you know, we're quite a ways away from neutral. Uh, The risks, even if they are balanced, we should be closer to neutral. And I think a path which starts at 50 rather than one that goes 25 and then 50 actually uh, communicates a more relaxed view about how the economy is doing right now. Whereas if you started at 25 and then in November did 50, it it would actually spook the market a little bit. Good morning, Ralph. So so just listening to that, you're fairly confident that a 50 would not signal that we're in a hard landing? No. I think, you know, we're so far, uh, you know, obviously when we were at zero, we were a long way from neutral. Yep. At five and a quarter to five and a half, we're also a long way from neutral. Uh, And if the risks of uh, slower employment and uh, inflation are roughly balanced, we should be closer to neutral. And to me, the statement should be, uh, we now have balanced risks. If anything, we have a little more risk that employment is going to grow too slowly and therefore we should be uh getting on with uh the pot uh the pat getting to yeah. neutral uh, just to break it down a little bit which bits of the u.s economy do you think need rate cuts right now is it the private sector i look at company margins they look fantastic no. still really good is, is it is it the employment story or is it the government's that needs a rate cut right now well the government benefits from a rate cut but Uh, The parts that I think need a rate cut are the uh, rate-sensitive sectors, like housing, uh, and uh, smaller business, uh, where all of their borrowing is tied to short rates, uh, prime uh, lines of credit, uh, etc. And so, and and by the, you know, big business is doing great. Uh, Margins are high. Top line growth is is decent, 
Uh, so I don't think the cases, you know, in the S&P 500 or the Dow Jones, the cases in the, the part of the economy that actually generates the vast majority of new jobs. How much of that strength, though, is at the whim of what might happen in the political space in the next six months? I'm curious, if we're talking about these interest rate cuts and this, this resilience, how much should the Fed be thinking about the continuity or the potential increase of, of tariffs in the next six months? Well, the Fed would always say that they uh, react to the economy, not to uh, fiscal policy or to trade policy. And I think that's basically uh, true. Uh, I think we are, we're in a period right now of significant economic uncertainty. We're in this transition period from when inflation was too high and it's now coming down. It hasn't quite reached the Fed's target yet, but it's certainly moving in that direction. And in, uh, unemployment is drifting upward. And, you know, as you just heard from the former Commerce Secretary, uh, there certainly is, you know, some risk that we will have not a soft landing, uh, but a mild uh, recession. All of that means there's uncertainty. Uh, the political period adds additional uncertainty. And so that's kind of a, uh, a chilling effect on uh, significant moves uh, by business. Well, Ralph, famously in 2019, Jay Powell basically announced an insurance cut to address the pain from tariffs, which is why I'm wondering if that playbook sees a little bit of a repeat. And if tariffs are even something the market and the economy has gotten used to, or maybe is the budget perhaps the bigger worry? Well, I think the uh, I think you have to separate uh, what I would call uh, trade balancing or, or tactical or targeted tariffs and blanket tariffs. Uh, blanket tariffs, I think, presage uh, and high tariffs presage a period of declining uh, free trade, which we've already entered somewhat. Uh, and that is inflationary and very bad for markets. Uh, so if that happened, I think we would we'd certainly see an effect in the markets. The impact in the economy would be you know, always uncertain. Well, we're already seeing, you, you mentioned the difference in blanket tariffs and target tariffs, we're already seeing that kind of a continuation of, of not just the Trump era, but even in the Biden era, a continuation of tariffs, not just on China, but on Europe as well. At what point is that so damaging to the economy? Well, the magnitude of them has not been that great uh, so far. And I, I think as a general matter, the Biden administration has tried to balance uh, you know, what they would call fair trade uh, and, uh, you know, a reasonable uh, relationship with Europe and our allies in Asia uh, and it, not a whole scale attack on uh, free trade. Uh, you know, being the special trade representative in the Biden administration has probably not been the most exciting job uh, <laughs> over the last four years. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, maybe. Uh, let's talk about areas of the market that might be exciting and talk about deals, because that's something right. I'm sure you have views on. Uh, we're just seeing another example this morning. Digital Bridge said to weigh the sale of a four, of, uh, of a, uh, of four billion dollar uh, firm Edgepoint. Just another example of maybe some deals going through. We heard from Barclays this week, Goldman Sachs this week, both saying things are starting to pick up on the deals front. Wishful thinking or actually seeing evidence of that? Well, there's definitely... Uh, a some pickup in the announced activity. If you look at the first uh, eight months or so of this year, uh, the dollar volume of announced transactions is up. Interestingly enough, the number of transactions is still down uh, this year. Uh, there's, you know, if we if I look at Evercore's business, we track uh, a number of indicators. Uh, the least forward-looking is our backlog, uh, which is, you know, tangible. Uh, the other measurable ones are uh, new uh, engagement letters signed. Uh, earlier than that is new conflicts clearance when a client calls us up and says, mm. hey, we're thinking of this, will you help us? And even earlier than that, which is not quantifiable, is active dialogue with our clients. Uh, the active dialogue with the clients is way up. 
uh, new engagement letters is up. Uh, uh, and conflicts clearances are up somewhere in between those two. So there's definitely a, uh, a significant amount of pent-up activity. Uh, as we talked earlier, we're in a period of economic uncertainty. Economic uncertainty is the enemy of announced activity. So yep. uh, it's, it's going to happen. It's a question of when it really starts. Do you think the Harris camp is generating economic uncertainty? We don't know yet what the Harris camp is going to deliver in terms of its economic agenda. We seem to be light on detail. What is your sense of that? Well, I, I, I'm not sure if I had a scale here and I watched the debate on yep. Tuesday night, which I did at 2 a.m., uh, <laughs> that uh, if, if, the, if going down was uh, on the one side was uh, how specific was the candidate uh, yep. in terms of their economic policy. Uh, I'm not sure that the Trump side would go down more than the, okay. the, the Harris side. So uh, I think that, you know, both of them are trying to, to say as little specifically that, so that they don't offend anyone. Uh, I actually think she's been more specific than he has, uh, at least in the last... You know, since she's entered the the okay. race, uh, and uh, you know, uh, so I don't think I think the fact that these are two very different visions for America definitely, and the it's a you know it's a toss up uh, definitely injects uncertainty. But I wouldn't put her uh, policy as being a, a principal contributor to that uncertainty. Well, you talk about her specifics. Her campaign is certainly outlined, as she has as well, in terms of a continuation of the Biden policy, which is uh, tackling drug pricing. She's talked about grocery prices, housing affordability. Economists and investors would listen to that and hear that and be concerned about that being a recipe for stagflation. Do you agree? No, I don't. I think that uh, there are two elements to her policy. Uh, and by the way, I am a Democrat, so take this all with a grain of salt. Uh, I think there are two elements to her policy. One, uh, it's a uh, twerk the uh, benefits of our society a little bit toward the middle class and those less privileged. And I think her policies on housing affordability, drug prices, uh, 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 child care, and the child tax credit all are geared there. And, you know, there's going to be a massive debate next year about the extension of the Trump yep. tax cuts. Uh, and I think the biggest difference between these two is the position that they will take on that, whereas Trump is for extending all of them and for, in fact, uh, expanding some of them on the corporate side. Uh, and she is clearly for expanding all of them for those below $400,000 in income and uh, cutting back on the corporate side. She's proposed 28% rather than 21% uh, and uh, probably eliminating some of the, the uh, cuts that are beneficial to the most uh, wealthy in our society. I don't think, I think it's a, a policy focused on a little bit of retorking toward the middle class and below, and a growth agenda. The the counter argument of that simply would be that the Trump tax cuts did rate for the economy. J.B. Diamond has made that point. A conversation for another time. Ralph Dawson, we have to leave it there. Evercore Chairman Emeritus and BlackRock co-founder, we thank you so much for joining the program.